He is that powerful. There's not another being that even is remotely close to being as awesome and as wonderful and as mighty and as exalted as our God. And yet our God, with his servant's mind, humbled himself. He lost prestige and status. He humiliated himself. He abased himself. Here you see the manifestation of a servant mind. It is not about pointing attention to yourself. It, it, it draw, it, that that uh, uh, servant's mind moves you to a lesser position. A servant mind leads you to sacrifice. Of course, this was seen in at least two ways in the life of Christ. First, he became human. That in and of itself for a divine being to become one of us was a humbling experience. Such a thing for a God is truly beneath him. And yet he assumed a lesser position anyway. And with that, he went through this. He endured the cross. That point of death that it refers to is the, the, the speaking of the cross. Speaking of how he died for you and for me. Let me tell you how awesome of a servant Jesus Christ is. Jesus could have remained in heaven. Jesus could have left you and left me in our sin. Jesus could have kept away from us and said, listen, you have sinned against me because of your sin. The penalty upon you, the wages of your sin is death. Not just physical death, but eternal separation. And, I, I, and he could have said, listen, I am fully justified in leaving you in your sinful state and allowing you to face the penalty of your disobedience and your rebellion against me. But Jesus didn't think that way because he had the servant mind. And Jesus, out of his mercy and out of his grace, humbled himself as a servant, came into this world, and allowed himself to be placed upon a cross. And upon that cross, the perfect Jesus Christ, Jesus, though he was a man, was not sinful like every other man. Because he was God, he had the innocence of, of sin, never committed one offense, and his perfect blood was shed for your imperfect blood. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And so, if you will open up your heart to Jesus Christ, this servant, who died for you, and give your life over to him, and ask him to forgive you of your sin, and you repent of your sin, and turn away from it, and you start going the way that God would have you to go, then he will save you, and he will forgive you, and that is why he came to the point of death, to serve you by offering you salvation. He did this. Why? Because he had a servant's mind and he had a servant's heart. You know, it's important to note, by the way, that the servant mind of Christ did not go back to his divinity ultimately. Very quickly, I want you to see at the very end, verses 9, 10, 11, how Paul concludes this little section with these words. By the way, when you stood and you recited the words earlier today, did you not know that you were reciting a hymn of the old church, the, 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 the early church? And so as a part of that hymn, we see these words, verses 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed in him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, God the Father has already highly exalted the Son. And he has already given him that name that is above every name. What's that name? Jesus. Jesus. Already he has declared, already he has been exalted, and already this word, this name has been declared, a name that is above every name. And one day, one day, though people may not do it today, one day that name is going to be uttered. And when that day comes, when that name is spoken, every name, at the, at every knee at the sound of that name will bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue shall confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is coming. Amen. Jesus is Lord. Amen. And yet this Jesus, this Lord of all, had a humble mind. Isn't that an amazing thought? This mind of Christ. You see, if Jesus did not come to, to be served, but, to, to, but himself to serve, should we not do any less? The great evangelist D.L. Moody once said, the measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. You see, servanthood, though we often think of it as a lowly place to be, servanthood is a high and noble role, and it is a key to joyful living. You ever heard the name of Harry Hopkins? Probably not for most of you, but Harry Hopkins was a close confidant for the, the, the late President Franklin Roosevelt. He was especially important during World War II where his influence was at, the, at its greatest with the president. 
And then at that time, he had no official cabinet position. However, one of the, the, his closeness with the president really called a lot of people to question this Harry Hopkins and what kind of influence is he having on our, our uh, uh, president anyway. Some people thought his role was sinister and shadowy. In fact, one of Roosevelt's political foes asked about him and he said, why do you keep Hopkins so close to you? I mean, you, you surely realize that people distrust him and resent his influence. And here's, here's how Roosevelt responded. He said, someday you may well be sitting here yourself where I am now as president of the United States. And when you are, you'll be looking at that door over, the, over there, knowing that practically everybody who walks through it wants something out of you, and you'll learn what a lowly job this really is, and you'll discover the need for somebody like Harry Hopkins who asks for nothing except to serve you. An interesting side note historically about Harry Hopkins, Winston Churchill, that great leader of Great Britain, said this of him. He said he is one of the half dozen most powerful men in the world from the, from the early 1940s, and the sole source of Hopkins' power, he said, was his willingness to serve. You see, church, like Harry Hopkins, our true power for greatness comes from our willingness to serve other people. You want to be great in this world? It's not about making yourself great. It's about building up other people by selflessly serving other people. In, in fact, as long as we're seeking for, for our own personal enjoyment, as long as it's only about us, we'll never find joy. But the moment that you turn your life into bringing joy to other people, in that moment, putting the focus on others rather than yourself, then you will find that joy. So here's the way we must think, church. If we want to experience joy in the face of humility, have a unified mind. Think as if we are all tuned to Jesus Christ. Have a humble mind. That is, put your needs aside and put the needs and interests of other people up first and meet those needs and ultimately do as Jesus did. Have a servant mind. Giving your life, even sacrificially, to other people for the glory of God. Would you bow with me, Lord Jesus? In this moment of prayer as we bow together, I thank you for this word, Lord, and this wonderful text that speaks so strongly to the divinity of you in the midst of your humanity. Lord, we can get so focused and encouraged and excited about the end when we talk about how every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. And as much as that thrills us, Lord, let us not jump over the fact that before that happens, you have already made yourself as a servant. You had that unified mind, that humble mind, that servant mind, to which Paul said, this is the means by which having this mind will complete my joy in Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us, please, Lord Jesus, to wrap everything up in you that we would find our joy completed in you. So whether we are exalted or whether we have been humbled, our joy is in Christ. Lord, thank you for your word, for the challenge. Now let's, let us leave our pride, embrace a humble life for you. In Jesus' name we pray.